<sighs> Nicholas. He's from Alaska. Good guy. I've seen more bears this year than I've seen in a long time. I saw a mother, mom and cubs back there last time and a, a big male bear too. They're all waiting for the fish to run up the river. I was born here in Sitka. Sheetka is the Clinket name, and the name now is Bernoff. That name should change back. Our place names have importance, and they had use. And the renaming of them <laughs> is all actively in line with that erasure of indigenous histories, indigenous presence, indigenous land and language. We come from oral history. Our histories were shared orally and then passed on, and, and they continually are still. All of my work deals with language, whether it's Klingit language or the cultural language of our visual art. It's a very iconic, powerful, visual, abstract language that's distinct to our community that's continually evolved and it continues to still today. Oftentimes, identity for indigenous communities is frozen in the past. There's this idea of a time period of pre-contact, and that is responsible for heavily romanticizing this narrative of the vanishing Indian, or upholding us as peoples that are gone and not here. That's damaging. An Indian petroglyph. I think this is like 10 years old, maybe? He's out here for days, just chipping at it. There's these ideas of authenticity, culturally speaking. We are only authentic if we're visually fitting a bill, or our work is, or our material, or our process, or our tools. Colonization has worked extremely diligently and hard to keep us in containers and boxes, not just through containment on reservations and land, but through our objects and institutions, our histories, our language. Suhedi Shugak Titan in Klinkit translates to, we will again open this container of wisdom that's been left in our care. That container of wisdom is our language, our dance, our music, our visual art, everything. And in a sovereign reclamation of power and space, that work is saying our work will look like this if it needs to. Our conversations will go here if they need to. We get to do whatever we want. We are allowed to imagine what form it can be without adhering to these ideas of romanticized perspective. I started in engraving and wood carving with my mentors, Wayne Price, Louis Menard, my father, and my uncle Will Burkhart. Nothing was more fulfilling for me than doing that work. And I was just eager to learn and try to understand what it means to be part of that continuum. I'm Nick's cousin. Our fathers are brothers. Both of them are Klingit artists. My father has done a lot. Big monumental work, big totems, several canoes as well. He's an accomplished engraver. Definitely one of the masters out there. I can remember being five years old and running around Totem Park where my father would carve. It's definitely in our family, in our blood. This is a house post, so it's work in progress. It's just roughing it out right now. I'll carve this half and we'll follow on the other half. And then we just move through like that. This is a historically relevant way of working and for an apprentice to learn. In my uncle's studio and my father's bench was always all the tools. The foundation of all the work comes down to understanding a tool, how to make a tool, how to maintain a tool. 
Shittah, nads. This is the trunk of a tree, the branch. This particular one is a pattern ad, so it flexes. Let's see that slight little. My uncle made this 30 years ago. There's several different sizes of ads. Is gutter ads, which is the big curve for really, really heavy work. No flex in this. Hook knives, curved, bent knife. It's a blade on both sides. You can do lots of detail work with it if needed. I did an Associate of Arts degree, and then from there went to London Guildhall University. Going to London, I brought a lot of excitement, but they said I could not use any of my cultural visual language in my work there. They said it was too literal. Oftentimes, we are asked to hang up our identity at the doors of these institutions. That's an extension of the damaging philosophy of kill the Indian, save the man. That is the idea and desire and process of forced assimilation, of removing every aspect of our being, every aspect of it, the food and subsistence and land, the language, the removal of children from indigenous families, placing them in boarding schools, all of that. It was essentially genocide and colonial violence against indigenous and brown and black bodies and nation building of the U.S. hasn't really stopped. Later, going to Massey University in New Zealand to do my master's in visual art, I was able to engage in these conversations and this work and bring my cultural perspectives and identities. And that was where a lot of my work really started to take place and happen. This is forming metal, essentially, so chasing a repose. So you work it from both sides, front and back, and clink it culture. A lot of old pieces, you'll see copper shaped and formed in this process. I start off with a sheet of copper, shape it, and then start doing the detail work. So it's really slow, slow work. Like months and months to finish a mask. Masks in our culture are significant and are used in different contexts, from ceremony to healing to storytelling. For Kildin and Save the Man, I have worked with Indonesian-made tourist knockoff masks, and I carved them down to chips and then reassembled them as masks in a pile. That visual reference of having to shape ourselves so much that we can't see or make sense of ourselves is that jumble of chips in a new form of a mask. You'll see here in town even with our tourism, our culture being consumed, our objects being consumed so heavily that it's just the ideas of them without us, to strip that so far that we're removed from it. And all you have is this mimic, this misappropriation that's a peak colonial consumption. Wow, Noma, your hair's so nice. Oh my gang. Oh, oh they look so nice. Oh, dogs. I'm just gonna let him clean oh. the baby's food up. All right. Yep. Nick and I met at a conference for a Native performance art. Between us, we have six kids. <laughs> one is one that's ours, that's a little little one-year-old, and then we've got older kids, each of us. Are you helping? Are you watching to make sure we do it right? This is Sakai. Sakai. Howard Johnson is uh, a name that often comes up as uh, one of the main <clears throat> contemporary Native American artists. So. Artistic couple. Catch them on a fly and, and rod, but these are dip net. Nick can catch a king salmon on the paddleboard, net it and club <laughs> it by himself, and paddle back to the boat with like three huge, and these are like 20 pound fish. They're not little. So it's not a small thing to net that fish. This is 
You're taking the yeah. bones out and cutting it down to size before we brine them. And then we'll dry them and glaze them. And for this, we're going to full smoke. Okay, everybody have gloves? All the kids are around a lot in everything that we do, and it's really important to us to include them in our work as much as we can. <laughs> Got it. Nick and I are very involved in supporting each other and collaborating on work when we can. We work collaboratively, but we also support each other's work, and we have different strengths, each of us, too. If we look at the process of salmon, skinning deer, picking berries, teaching our children the process of connection to place and land, all of these ways of surviving and being and caring and loving that got us here today, generationally, through our ancestors, has and holds something that I would say is a, like a memory in our DNA. And that memory and that DNA surfaces in those processes and through joy, like a, a feeling of joy. You can't capture it in any other way, but just let it pass through you. The only way you can share that is through teaching your children. In these institutional spaces across the globe, the wealth of culture that they have has oftentimes been mined and removed from other communities. Almost all of these objects have been stolen. Almost all of them have certainly been created for context of cultural use and not of colonial imprisonment. They're objects of power that don't belong in these spaces. It's a blueprint, it's a plan, it's a map. The next step for this, once this is covered in this pigment, will be to paint the floor plan of the Anchorage Museum with notes on where our cultural objects are in those spaces. So it can almost be a, an escape route or a plan of removal. The idea that these objects wouldn't be here without those spaces is a major myth. We've cared for our culture and our objects and our community's knowledge and for 15,000 plus years, right? Our communities are fighting for many things, including the return of our objects. In some cases, return of our ancestors' bones. The real change isn't going to happen with our communities only being the ones that are responding and leading ways in these conversations. The real change has to come from the communities that are perpetuating it or the communities that are upholding it by remaining complicit in the system, in those institutions. And the work that I've been doing has always been about bringing light to some of these conversations. for two years. It's gonna be released with Sub Pop Records, which is such a legendary record label. Music, you can explore like visual art endlessly. Being able to move freely is really a necessity for me. There can be a lot of discovery and uncertainty and power and sound. You have to remain open to what that might be. For me, the process, it's more about being receptive and then trusting those ideas when they come. I don't know what'll be next. I don't have an expectation of that, and that's liberating. Yeah, and I think he hit on many of the uh, 
themes and messages that these artists were looking at today uh, are expressing in their own way, um, <clears throat> reaffirming their native traditions and looking at how they've been twisted and distorted and uh, stolen um, by what they call it colonial white European culture and also the stereotypes and having the stereotypes have been commercialized and um, um, putting that out for us to see to increase our own awareness that this is happening and some of it is very uh, we just without giving it much thought we just kind of buy into it uh, our images or beliefs are about Native Americans and so these artists are like um, making you think well right you know it's like challenging our our um, I guess, cultural assumptions about Native Americans. And that's um, really listening. It's also a chance to really listen to their point of view. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So I've got another one at hand. Let's see what this one is. Maybe that's star. It's another Nicholas, though. I think that was worth saying. Let's see what this one is up again. So I'm like two. My people have lived here since time immemorial, 15,000 plus years of connection to this place. My name's Nicholas Glannon, Yehietzin. We are in my hometown, uh, Sitka, Alaska. The chosen narrative of Palm Springs is one of Hollywood in a sense. California has a major history, like much of America, in settler uh, colonialism of removing indigenous communities literally from land and place. If you look at the street names, it was a playground for Hollywood. The history of Hollywood, the sign itself, is highly problematic, which historically was um, real estate land advertisement for white only communities. There's still communities deeply impacted by this. It's a sentinel piece and I think it really addresses one of the fundamentals about a show like this which is in some ways taking the legacy of land art and seeing what it means today. The sign says Indian land. It's presenting a truth that's not chosen to be Indigenous communities, the original stewards to this place for 10,000 years have less than 3% of land title. The most important aspect of this work isn't actually the sign. The most important part of this work is the land that it's on and the history of who engages with that. Choosing these histories and narratives that you decide you will never forget while con continually actively ignoring the histories here. This work is trying to invite everyone to understand these histories and to participate. <laughs> Wendy Red Star. Yes, I got three of hers. Dali was addicted to controversy. If life got indigenous futurisms, beliefs, ideas, and worldviews in the context of science fiction, fantasy, and other genres used by Native First Nations and Indigenous artists to reimagine reality through a lens untainted by or directly critiquing colonialism. The Crow Reservation, established in Montana May 1868, is home to over 8,000 people. One is award-winning Epsaluke artist Wendy Redstar, who grew up on the reservation before attending Montana State University in Bozeman, Montana. At Bozeman, she received her Bachelor's of Fine Arts. Later, she earned her Master's of Fine Arts with a concentration in sculpture from the University of California, Los Angeles. Today, Wendy Redstar resides in Portland, Oregon, and her work is paving a path for Native women's voices in the contemporary art world. 
By putting herself wearing traditional regalia into the artificial space, her series Four Seasons criticizes how Native Americans are represented in museums as being primitive people of the past who were closer to nature. Red Star references museum diagrams and artificial nature exhibits through her use of commercial Western landscape backdrops, blow up animals and artificial plants. Over two thirds of native women have experienced sexual violence in their lifetime, making them one of the largest demographics of sexual assault victims. The term squaw has been used in a derogatory fashion towards Native women. This is one of the many reasons why White Squaw, the 80s and 90s adult Western novel series, is incredibly insensitive and inappropriate. <laughs> in her own White Squaw artist series, Wendy Redstar uses the cover of the books, including the title, and the sexualized imagery featured at the bottom as a backdrop for her digitally recreated masterpiece. As a replacement for the center image, half native heroine, she poses in an exaggerated humorous sexual pose to highlight the absurdity of these adult novels. Through this series, and like many indigenous futurism's art pieces, Wendy Redstar has not only brought attention to the capitalist exploitation of indigenous women, but has effectively reclaimed a body of work from the fictional realm of colonialism and made it her own. The combination of European and Victorian fashion motifs, 70s silhouettes, and Native American design each inspired the futuristic regalia of the fierce, ambiguous beings portrayed in Wendy Redstar's 2011 series, Thunder Up Above. Again, utilizing the power of photography, Photoshop, and graphics, her designs express her interpretation of first contact with an unknown indigenous people, those that you would not want to mess with, as she states in her artist statement on the series. This interplanetary landscape displays interwoven aspects of sci-fi and traditional Native American garb, making the pieces powerful symbols of indigenous futurism in a frontier authentically red stars. Wendy Redstar is one of many in the canon of indigenous futurism's artists reimagining their reality through a lens untainted by or directly critiquing colonialism. Her artwork is a direct response to the perceptions, stereotypes, and unjust treatment she and her people have been subjected to since the beginning of colonization. She powerfully paves the way for other Native First Nations and Indigenous women to use their voices and represent their people in the world of contemporary art. over a year with Wendy to pull this show together. So it's very exciting that it's come together tonight after so long in the planning process. Wendy Redstar, A Scratch on the Earth, is a mid-career retrospective of one of America's rising young artists. Wendy's work explores her identity as a member of the Crow Tribe, and she chose the Newark Museum in part because of its collection of both historic and contemporary Native American art. New galleries dedicated to the Native artists of North America opened in 2016. That experience in 2016 was a great one for reconnecting with the local um, Lenny Lenape communities. So it kind of really refocused the fact that this literally is Lenape land that the museum is sitting on. And the Lenape Trail runs right through the city of Newark. The catalog for Wendy's exhibit acknowledges this. Uh, Lenny Lenape is a tribe where I grew up, um, South New Jersey, Central Jersey, South Jersey, Philadelphia, Delaware, That's that was where um, they were based. When I was in grad school, I think it was around the holiday times and I wasn't able to go home and I was really missing home. 
without even really consciously thinking about it, I, I knew I could find uh, crow stuff, crow objects, if I went to the Natural History Museum. And now I'm like, wow, that's kind of morbid, right? <laughs> My experience there is what led to the making of the work. And when I walked into the museum, I walked under this giant brontosaurus and all these dinosaur bones. And I, I walked into the native galleries. It's dark in there. I found some crow material. But I also had, was witness to everybody like looking at the native objects and realizing, wow, you know, I'm sure the audience, just the way that we've sort of been set up immediately as we walk through the door assumes that these people don't no longer exist and there were dioramas they look like Montana and I was like I need to take this back and make this piece that articulates my experience the four seasons photographs launched her career ever since Wendy Redstar has been creating work centered around Native American history and her life growing up on the Crow Reservation in Montana so this is uh, my first eagle plume for my first dance. For crows, it's called a wisdom feather, or um, AKA eagle butt feather, because it's located near the tail, it's the seat of knowledge and the soul of the bird. So what I've learned is that people don't know about native people at all. They don't know the history, which isn't just native history, it's US history. Wendy began to consider how images of Native Americans are used in our culture, such as a photo of Medicine Crow on a bottle of tea. And it made me wonder, like, the people that are using these images, do they know his name? Do they know that he's Crow? Do they know that he's from Montana? Then I started thinking, wait a minute, I don't know what happened that day when he sat down to take that portrait. And so it was that one question, and it just led me on this incredible adventure of looking through archives, of going through history. The note she took became part of a new series using the historic peace delegation photos as a starting point. It wasn't just him. It was a group of six chiefs, and there are portraits of five of the six chiefs that are delegation portraits from 1880. They were going there to meet the president because the U.S. government was trying to put a train through a large chunk of our hunting territory. And like all of these things started coming out of this one project. The more and more that I dug, the more things were revealed, the more I knew I didn't know things, and it just kind of kept going. So I do use a, a mix of photography, some of my own photography, some archival photography, and some of my family's photography. Wendy took her own photos for the series, Home is Where My Teepee Sits, showing life on the Crow Reservation today. In the 19th century, its original size was over 38 million acres. Our current reservation has been reduced down to like 2.25 million acres. And so basically, what I'm articulating with this work is what the current reservation looks like. What I know of the Crow Indian Reservation today, because this is where I grew up, and these are sort of the normal things that you would see if you were to drive through my reservation. You'd run into these objects, which are these reservation cars, sort of these broken down cars that have different lives, like they become storage units or a place for me and my cousins to like play in. I love sweat lodges. I find them really fascinating, especially when you're driving around my reservation because they're just out in the landscape. You see these weird dome things, and I like that they're very utilitarian, that they're covered in blankets and carpet and uh, anything they can find to keep the heat contained inside for when they... Wendy built her own sweat lodge at the Newark Museum. While there are no hot rocks or steam, climbing inside does transport you to another reality. The significance when you go inside for, for the crow is that it's a place to sort of get away from the outside world, to, to pray and think about others, and to kind of reconnect with your spiritual side. 
So when I go back home and you see some of these photos of the broken down res cars or the government houses, one would think, oh, this is like a, a poorer community. But for me, I don't see that at all. I just see the cultural richness and vastness of it all. And also considering my ancestors fought so hard for us to keep our, our cultural knowledge. So I have several pieces in the exhibition. We looked at the Ever uh, Curtis photos before, so uh, and those photos have influenced um, several um, photographers and American photographers and how they work with them. One as a body of work called Absolaga Feminist, um, which I've collaborated with my eight-year-old daughter Beatrice. We are wearing our traditional outfits, elk tooth dresses. We have shawls and beaded bags, and we set up our living room with those items. And we've sort of posed in very classical poses that you see other images from the turn of the century. Another body of work is I took 15 of Edward Curtis portrait photos of the crow, and I work specifically with the crow tribe, which is my tribe. And I cut out all of the men in the photos. A lot of these men have been photographed before and their images have also been used like in the commercial world on like honest tea and on books and things like that. And I just wanted to give them their power back because when they're reproduced so many times, things get lost in translation. So I cut them out of the frame so all you see is these framed silhouettes. And that actually shows a lot about how Curtis posed people and really kind of his influence over the sitter. With that piece also there will be wax cylinder recordings that he took of Crow Men and it adds this really kind of haunting quality because they're no longer there. There's also a map that I did. All the names that are on this map are, are people that he photographed and it was really important for me to to place some context of where I'm from and where my ancestors are from. And then the other kind of really great part about this map is that I, I then asked all these Crow women to please send me photos of them in elk tooth dresses. I collected those and printed them on transparency paper and those are pinned to the map. So sort of also kind of another ephemeral quality, but you're seeing pure crowness. It's their dear photos of, of their children, how they wanted to be photographed, and um, which is not what you're getting with the Curtis show. It's all Curtis kind of on top of each of the images. <laughs> and then also I wanted to do something with the Curtis uh, photos of the crow because he mainly took pictures of men. And um, I selected three uh, images that he took of crow girls and a woman. And I, through Photoshop, erase the material of their dress because crows are known for vibrant color. And with the portrait of uh, my daughter and I, it's vibrant color. And that's what you would have seen if he had color technology. And to empower those photos, I'm asking people to color them back in the traditional colors. <clears throat> Wendy Red Star. And I think that leads into uh, a photographer. Since we left off with her photographer, pick up Will Wilson, Native American photographer. I got <clears throat> two brief ones about him. Good afternoon, everyone. Working also with you all get A's for getting here on time. Uh, he's also working worked in one of those with the Curtis photos, but not just that. Autoimmune response is about this kind of post-apocalyptic Navajo man roaming a beautiful but somehow toxic landscape and trying to figure out how to exist in that space. The title references autoimmune disease, which kind of disproportionately affect Native American populations. 
So when I was making this series, I was thinking, in some ways, Native Americans are, are this sentinel population. We're the canaries in the, in, in the coal mine, but we all share this coal mine. <laughs> So it's also about a response though. So it's about kind of claiming agency and trying to figure out how to um, exist in that space and, and, and move forward and survive. The SIPIC series, uh, the Critical Indigenous Photographic Exchange, which is a little bit more in response to images like the ones that uh, Edward S. Curtis created. I invite sitters to come and participate in this almost performance. I make their photograph uh, with this historic photographic process called uh, wet plate that kind of predates Curtis actually. He did do some wet plate, but by the time he moved into the North American Indian project, uh, dry plate had been invented. So I use this, this historic photographic process where you're actually hand making emulsions kind of walking the, the sitter through the process of the portrait kind of ritual. And then at the end, I gift the, the object, the, the actual um, tin type that, that is the thing that's in the camera, to the sitter in exchange for a scan of it. With the SIPIX project uh, in particular, I mean, I kind of frame that in some ways strategically around this idea of working you know, with historic images of, of Native Americans. And of course, Curtis is you know, the most well-known. He's kind of the archetypical creator of the photograph of the Native American. You know, in a lot of ways, I think, has in some authored this, this almost mythic image of, of who we are. And that image is, is prevalent even today, I think, in a lot of people's minds and imaginations. And so, the work that I'm doing right now, some of the process or some of the project is focused around photographing Native Americans. It's, it's open to anybody actually, and it's really as much about photography and I think exchange and, and you know, kind of performance, ritual, some people call it relational aesthetics. But more specifically, there's this element that, that talks about the way that we think of Native Americans, like through photography. So I'm kind of updating that practice and process, I think. The tagline is, uh, what, if, what if Indians invented photography? <laughs> you know, would there be a different set of kind of protocols or ideas or you know, notions of exchange in relation to this, this kind of image making process? My name is Will Wilson and I'm a photographer and an artist uh, based in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I'm Diné. Um, I'm also Irish and Welsh. The, the title of, of the project that I'm um, showing here at SAM is um, it's called the Critical Indigenous Photographic Exchange, uh, CIPICS for short. It's about a dialogue around photography and portraiture that hopefully engages the, the sitter or the person being photographed as a collaborator and working with an old historic photographic process to um, create a story about a person. I think shortly after 2012, I ran across this technology, the Layar app. But it was a way to kind of visually embed um, video and other media into, into the object. And I had, I had worked previously actually with um, QR codes um, to do a similar thing. But you know, the, the nature of the AR with Layar is that the image becomes the code. And so it's a much yeah, more kind of trans so fluid transition so from the still to the video. So you're, looking, you're pointing at the part? When I started the project, I framed it kind of in relation to Curtis's work. I think I, to some extent that was strategic. I mean, I knew that his 150th birthday was coming up. Framing my work in relation to that would give me uh, access to to kind of dialogue, to space, to, you know, shows like this where people want to show the Curtis work, but they now feel like it needs to be recontextualized, you know, like the stories need to be shifted, augmented. Um, I think thinking about archives that have been developed around kind of this collection of information. Um, and there's a tension between, I think, uh, the archive and the repertoire, at least in, in a lot of native cultures. Most um, indigenous cultures are orally based, right? So oral tradition is the way that like history, knowledge, ways of knowing are passed down. And archives just kind of in and of themselves like amass authority. And so I'm, I'm trying to kind of explode the archive in some sense uh, by giving away the original, um, by um, including 
now multimedia so that the, the archive kind of speaks back to you um, from its own kind of position. In some ways, like, I, I'm devoted to the project, you know. Uh, I think, you know, in a way that, like, Curtis was. He, he definitely, um, you know, was a driven guy who was, like, on a mission to create this incredible body of work. I, I think there's just something about that, like, being the author of an archive or a collaborator in, in the creation of an archive that just drives someone to kind of, you know, you, you find, it like, a simple project and um, it propels you. Did you see that where you put your cell phone at the, at the photo and then the person comes alive because they're dancing or talking about themselves? I have a problem getting back that. Let's see. Oh, there you go. Okay. Uh, there is this uh, collective group of small number of artists called Post Commodity, um, who are doing like installation projects uh, around to raise awareness of issues like, like borders, Mexican American border, um, et cetera. So I've got a couple of videos on that then. There's a whole PBS special about them too. It was an hour long. That's too long for things. Oh, this is just the um, Wikipedia entry about commodity. Current members are Kay Twist and Crystal Martinez and a few other creators. Commodity, post commodity uses modern technology, sound video in a way that goes against what would be considered as Native American commodity or Much of this work has been uh, considered as asthma, which is autonomous sensory meridian response uh okay some kind of evoking a physical response that goes back down your spine okay recently they've been incorporating their work into architecture such as adding speakers to pre-existing buildings or creating their own structures uh, I always think I can get to it. um Let's see, another recurring theme in ours is use of bird scare balloons, which contain elements of Native American colors and iconography. Their context for using these balloons is to function as an intervention, repelling the manifestations of Western worldview and imagination. Uh, and also they do some music. All right, so let's see what we got here with them. I'll show that other project. It's looking pretty good looking out here. Looking good. This could be our uh, opportunity. Yeah, I think this is it. Quarter. The piece is called the repellent fence. What we are proposing to construct is a two-mile monument that crosses the border. Sorry, um, forgive my ignorance. What you guys are talking about is another fence on, on the border? It's almost to flip the script or to complicate the way we understand fences. When I look at the borderlands, I see a, a clear demarcation of colonization. That's the underlining meaning of that border. If the word Mexican in this country is synonymous with alien and illegal, we've forgotten the indigeneity of those people. People can't remember what it means to be American, not United States citizen, American as in of the Americas indigenous peoples of this hemisphere have had to bear genocide, but they also mixed with Spanish settlers and families. I am a product of that. I grew up in north central New Mexico, where the communities were all indigenous pueblos. My ancestors are Native American pueblo people and Chicanos, Mexicanos. I grew up three hours from the border. I was son of a Cherokee plumber in a town that 
was largely defined by migrant farm workers. You saw indigenous people everywhere, whether you've been anglicized or hispanicized. Two more would be for sure. Okay. Post-commodity was born for the purposes of doing repellent fence. That was our first idea out of the gate. That idea started in 2006. Our whole art practice was built out during that time. The idea of the balloons is to intersect the U.S.-Mexico border. That signified a suturing or connecting of the Americas together. In indigenous cultures, this eye means an open eye, uh, an eye that's aware, an eye that's knowledgeable. This work is testimony that the indigenous people presupposed this hard edge border. Suturing is remembering. And healing. And reasserting one's place on the land. The border wall, it's a very long line, but what is the border really doing? It's like a corral. It's trapping Americans more than anything. It's fencing us in. At the same time, indigenous peoples continued moving northward, marking a new journey, the new migration. So what does it entail? Like It'll be eight of the 12 columns will get filled all the way down to the bottom. Okay. On um, the remaining columns will get filled three feet down. And what those will do is those will hold the additional remar that will stick up out of the top of the column. And that'll take a day, right? That'll take all day. So we'll be here. Uh, 10 years ago, I met these guys at the Arizona State University Art Museum. They had a slab of the concrete floor cut and mounted on a pedestal. And then they suspended a microphone over the earth beneath and had a speaker with a native peeposh ceremony being played at a very low volume. So as you walked in, you weren't sort of struck by the sound until you got a little bit closer. The project was very related to the land literally beneath the museum, and that was burial um, grounds. They seemed to always be able to find something very interesting about the site where they were working. I was really interested to see what they might think about in the context of Chicago. Wow, it's pretty sick to watch. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like a little dance. After building the repellent fence, we started thinking about our future demographically here in the United States. The U.S. Census projected that 2043 will be the year that white people in the United States become a minority. Here in Chicago, we're in the middle of one of the largest migrations of peoples from the south to the north. A lot of people think of Chicago as being ground zero for the great black migrations. This is even larger in scale. There are currently over 750,000 people in the county who are of Mexican descent. And that number is growing, will continue to grow. So the expectation is that the landscape is gonna be transformed culturally, politically, socially. <laughs> we wanted to build a piece to mark that this transformation is happening. This migration is happening. Throughout all of Latin America, you oftentimes will find these columns that are projecting off the rooftops of homes. And a lot of times people 
who are not from Latin America misinterpret the meaning of those columns. They think that the, the homes are unfinished. Es un castillo para nosotros. Así le llamamos. Vamos una columna fuerte por donde se va a levantar un edificio grande. La típica de que después ahorrale y después vamos a hacer el segundo piso. Esa es la típica. Siempre dicen eso y siempre quedan esos castillos ahí a punto del segundo piso. Algunas veces se logran y algunas veces no. What the columns often signify is a pragmatic approach to growth. As the family expands, the home expands. And so the house is always growing, always emergent. This piece and the skyline that surrounds it, it's a way to acknowledge a very strong Mexican cultural tradition being established here in Chicago. And that cultural transformation also happened a long time ago in California. So we wanted Los Angeles to inform the next project. You're like the mayordomo of low riding or <laughs> custom or rod. Doing what I do for a living is I build people's dream car or, you know, their, their, their bucket list car. And I know the stereotype is like the bouncing Impala. Everybody's thinking Boys in the Hood, uh, Friday, but it's deeper than that. Come on through, I'll show you the rest of the shop. Low riding, it's about hacking the car, reimagining the car as mobile sovereign space. And we have always imagined ourselves and fashioned ourselves as hackers. Chicanex people have been able to develop themselves in the city through this process of modifying and salvaging and recycling. Every car is a story. You know, Chicanos are the pillars of the, of the city. We want to build new public memory about LA. So the way we're going to set this up is we want to run like a mid to late 70s style graphic. Yeah. Just wait till we got all the colors on here. That's when it really explodes, you know? similar to what we're doing in Chicago, in LA. We're taking the architecture, the very bones of the building, and we're hacking it. Go ahead and polyester primer it and block it. Working with Plus Commodity, it was about self-expression, helping us expose lowriders to a different audience. For us to be able to leave a mark in a permanent structure that my grandkids will probably see someday. It's very empowering. These high beams are like the indigenous people, like the Latinos that built LA, right? That everybody walks by them day in, day out. We don't notice the guy who's selling elotes at the corner. We don't notice the guy who's cutting our lawn, but it's part of the infrastructure. It's part of the strength that makes the city what it is. The beauty of us working together, it, it's incredibly powerful. Salud, salud. We feel that in order to have a world, we need to divide ourselves from one another. How are you? Good, oh, man. good. But that love we get to experience, oftentimes when we're making art together. They sort of restored in a lot of ways our faith in humanity. Our self-determination is proliferating. We're starting to find our way in the places that we wouldn't otherwise be in.
We've made the covers, which are cedar boxes, so that those columns are being preserved. They'll be there permanently with that building. Columns that no one will ever see, but at certain times of the year, those cedar boxes will be opened up and taken off to acknowledge that history of a people in a community. When people of color become the majority, I hope we'll have built enough dignity to be good stewards of one another, of each other, of ourselves, of the land. Post commodity isn't an identity building project. Our job is to provide space for people to connect their own narratives of cultural self-determination and to allow a new public memory to be born. Like that pollute in his eyes, the color of the dark way, which has a power and works in my space, and this one uh, object is in the dark way. I'm going to put it around. Let's see if I can see one more. Hold on. All right, do I need another photographer? Oh, I got a couple more. <clears throat> I find that the coming together to make art from different kind of people is is very good. Yes. Yeah. And I think they were at one point there. The wall construction was going on two years ago, and I think they were even uh, celebrating with the construction workers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as it should be. I think we're all together. I don't uh, consciously come in here, I guess, other myself in some ways. The conversation that happens uh, in-house or, or you know, in the market was, are you an artist who is Indian or are you an Indian artist? People would say, you know, why do we have to choose? Why do we have to differentiate when you don't? Maybe it's a, that idea of the relationship to tradition and how you keep traditions. I consider myself first generation urban Indian. My father's from the Meskwaki Nation of Iowa. My mother's from the Ho-Chunk Nation of Nebraska. The tribe, originally they were in Rhode Island and then just kept traveling west. The state government of Iowa decided to let the Meskwakis live in Iowa. As a child, when we were returning from visiting our relatives, my mother would always say while we're sitting in the car, when you get to school and they ask you to do that show and tell, you can tell them, you know, you went to see your grandparents, but don't tell them anything about what, you know, what you've seen and what you've done. Because the white man doesn't understand the Indian. And if you tell them anything, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to take it away. You know, that was their law, basically. We honored their law. I think the, the real idea was to give us a sense of our difference, that we are not like them, and that we do have a responsibility or what I would call a kind of sense of stewardship over cultural information. When I was young, I was always drawing. My big thing was also playing with clay. <laughs> Uh, just seeing like you know the different types of art that was being made, the costumes, hearing the different songs, and just knowing that that was something that was something intense, that it was something beautiful. It didn't seem like anybody else when I would go to school had that. Then one day as a teenager, I realized that there was a loophole in my parents' law that they had said you may not speak, but they never said you and you cannot paint or draw either. I decided if I wanted to talk about or you know, convey some of the things that were part of the culture, I could find an equivalent visually through art. 
And so that's when I went into painting. I've been making white paintings for about uh, 18 years. At some point I decided I was not a colorist, but I like space and atmosphere. So I began to use these kinds of acrylic mediums that were translucent in layers and layers. They were very subtle, they were abstract, just field paintings, monochromes. And then I was involved with a lot of kind of writing, artist books and performance as well, and uh, storytelling. And I wanted the paintings to kind of bridge the gap. I wanted them to kind of involve some of the uh, content of these stories. And so I began making shadow paintings, my own shadow and the shadow of a, a, a coyote mask. The process was to place the object in front of the painting, shine a light on it, and then, then I would trace the shadow and paint around it and build up paint around it or over it, layering shadows over shadows. So after a while, they began to take on motion. And I had a, a sort of umbrella title that was uh, Instructions on the Care and Use of White Space. Basically the mask, and there's a, what they call a katsina. It's a carved figure, it was a wolf dancer. Something that would be considered the folk object. But the idea was to reanimate the folk object. I considered it sort of a recovery project to put it into this kind of other space and to give it its own context and not, a, you know, not as sort of a market object. One series of paintings was called uh, Wolves and the Irises, and it was uh, repeated shadows of the same object, one of the, the wolf Katsina walking through a bunch of shadows of irises. You know, it was back in the landscape again. But everything is white, and so it reads as one coherent space. I think the paintings had a certain kind of hush, because the white space just kind of caused you to sort of, your mind just to empty out or something. And then you realize there's a lot of things going on, a lot of subtleties. My parents were getting sick. And in 2004, my mother passed away. And then four years later, my father passed away. You know, that was a very intense sort of personal experience and to, just to see that happen. And then my little sister passed away. And there was a lot of that kind of that heaviness. And I began to kind of think about the absence of light and the idea that, you know, there's something unknowable. And so what had happened was that when I came back, you know, it, you know, it wasn't in me to want to make a white painting. And so the paintings all started to turn black. Both my father and my little sister were uh, veterans. I started to make these narrative paintings using the flag to reference veteran status and then these kinds of objects. So they're very kind of like requiem kind of dreams. And after a while, the, the stripes on the flags, you know, the visual thing about the stripes began to kind of take hold. And then the paintings just started evolving into these very hardcore uh, geometric stripe paintings. And so that's, that's where we're at now. Well, the umbrella title is The Untraceable Present. At this point, I think the work, you know, there's, it's still kind of, you know, immersed in the, the situation with my family. And in that sense, it's, you know, the work is being made out of something like that. Whereas some of the earlier work was trying to engage with some of these other issues, these kind of world issues. I work a lot and I look to the work, you know, for the next step. When I come to the studio, it's, it's not so much a labor, but it's trying to get to that point where, you know, I know I can move on, but at this point, I have to kind of stay and finish something that I've started. I don't know where the next phase will be. I don't want to, you know, be that somebody who's sort of chained to this, you know, this kind of subject matter. These paintings have to have that, that thing that can, I don't know what it is. It's tangible, it's intangible. It's trying to define that or to find that, you know, some kind of resonance that it has. The only way to get there is to have to, <laughs> to make them. I was on another panel at the Aldrich Museum 
for a show called No Reservations. The moderator for the panel, you know, he introduces the panel, the subject of the panel, and then he looks over at me. All of a sudden, he was looking to me for the content of the panel. You know, I'm, I'm, I was so used to, as a younger artist, going to panels and seeing my mentors, Edgar Heap of Birds, Sean Quick to see Smith, James Luna, Truman Lowe, Kay Walking Stick. They were eloquent spokespeople, you know, they addressed the issue. Suddenly, uh, <laughs> you reach the age where you realize you're the, the elder. <laughs> and then you got to figure out what to do. And then, uh, I call Matika Wilbur. Uh, she's a photographer. She's actually quite well known. I never heard of her. That's her. And um, visual storyteller from the Swinomish and Tulip peoples of coastal Washington. And um, she's going around and again updated the Curtis. Um, photos, make them contemporary. And she went around to hundreds of tribes taking photographs. Uh, she has a background in fashion, commercial work in LA and, and studied photography at the Brooks Institute of Photography. So she was very successful, but kind of gave it all up and just focused on um, devoting herself to um, photography of um, <clears throat> native peoples, native tribes, uh, among other things. But she left the commercial world, just went out on her own. Um, so she's had a lot of success throughout her life, whatever she does. Um, so for her, this project, she um, she visited members of over 300 sovereign nations. Uh, that's just about everybody, all the tribes in 40 states, all over the country. Okay. So uh, there's a site here with some of her photographs. Yeah, it's called Project 562. I don't know what you got the name. So they're arranging a slideshow. And, um, once so I start it, it's kind of, there you go, it's going on its own. So we just look at, I uh, get a few seconds, but again, tribes from all over the country and with Curtis in mind as a backdrop. There is information here, but there's no time to read them. But this is called project52.com. Yeah, 
All right, that's all the photos in the latest we start. Let's see. Yeah, okay. All right, and that again, her name. Um, I think the Wilbur. So we're coming at 321. I might have some time to watch another that other video I was talking about. But any comments? We looked at all these uh, contemporary artists. Nicholas Galleran, Wendy Red Star, Will Wilson, the photographer, Post Commodity Art Art Collective, Dwayne Slick, the painter, Matika Roller, photographer. Um, so. I'm very happy to see these at this, certainly at this moment in time. I've always felt favored to, for the American Indians. And, uh, and I, it was just such an amazing thing that the first, the first act that uh, the last pr so-called president, huh. he, it was an act against the Indians. Yeah, what was that? The, um... It was the pipeline. That's right, Permit permitting the pipeline. It was show and tell his ugly signature so it's like, I mean, yeah. the violations of their yeah yeah but he was uh well you know it's always something it's either the uh, gold or uh, metals in the ground or need to pass oil and gas over their ground uh whatever you know we'll let you have this land until we need it basically anyway it's very good to uh, mm -hmm. see this and and hear you know that positive spirit still there yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah especially yeah. because, you know, it was like they almost killed it. They tried to, yeah. It's like the buffalo got near extinction. Yeah, yeah. Numbers they've been, and um, I don't know. I think all these, all these um, Indians that got killed, you know, they're reincarnating, and and they're yeah. in our culture. Some of them reincarnated as Native Americans today. Some of them are as, as um, whites, but um, it's almost like a the whole cultural underpinnings is there. It's beginning to realize we need those values in order to survive today. And then yeah, yeah. survival skills, it's gonna, um, so, you know, we've had our way, we've taken it, the destruction to its logical conclusion and then how much longer we can go with that. And then really we're gonna have to fall back on um, uh, a, a contemporary way of, um, implementing their values and their belief systems. And well, their, it's just that, kind of ironic, whoever, whoever we are. Say that I mean, again? We're, whoever we are, you know, wow. we're so totally in question, you know, the whole thing, make America great again. I mean, the whole right. strange, just strange, you know, just, uh, I mean, it, a, a good way to have a migraine, think about making us great again. You know? I, know. I, I had a question for you, Joel. Yeah. <clears throat> you, you kind of just um, went into it, but I was just thinking your immersion in this and quite deeply, and I thank you immensely for sharing. Um, how do you find it's changing your outlook, your being, or your sensitivity? You, you did kind of just mention it a couple paragraphs ago. But um, yeah, it's, how it's, how is it shaping? Is it you, how do you find it shaping? Yeah. And, and yeah. the other connection to listen listen humanity. We were reading that in Jimmy Modi's group, and just um, you know Baba's vision for the future and um, the appreciation of of all cultures. And he was looking at it a bit more from the Indian point of view right. of so many cultures together. But for your own personal experience and this immersion and, and um, I mean, sharing with all of us. Good question. Well, this isn't the first time I've done this, that periodically through my life have been very drawn to um, 
uh, indigenous cultures and learning about them. And I think uh, each time I do it, I learn more and and um, appreciate just learn more um, to appreciate more or, or have more depth of understanding. And and it might take like it might be in a three month period frame. That's what I tend to do three or four months where I just immerse myself in in uh, reading books or or watching doc now with YouTube, you know, watching documentaries or whatever. And um, so I'm, I seem to be in that period. And it got triggered off by the, that um, uh, book I published, which is um, the <clears throat> A Sparrow for All Sparrows, which draws on Native American mythology. So as I'm rewriting it this summer, it, it triggered off. It, when I finished it, I'm going to do this. Uh, so, um, and I think it just um, uh, it does a couple of things for me. It, it, it makes me sad at what we've done and what the loss and trying to come to terms with how this was part of the divine plan to allow this to happen. And also um, a, a belief that the, the solution for our, our <clears throat> environmental problems, our cultural problems, I mean, Mayor Baba spelled it out, but I think um, it's also implicit in, their, in, in indigenous people's value systems. Uh, not all of them. I mean, a lot of them were warring with each other uh, but there were certain there were certain ones that ha had it, you know. Were um, well, the respect for the respect for nature and, and that the divine, the great spirit, is implicit in nature is permeates every uh, that that value. And that's what's been lost. And I think until we until we find that again, um, and that's what's enabled us to uh, destroy the earth. Is that there's no divine spirit there. It just it's just there for humans to to uh, take as much as they want for our and it's. And uh, there's no soul in animals, which allow people to kill all the buffalo. There's no soul there. And, and, and the way we uh, you know, raise chickens and cows these days, uh, there's no soul there. But, so, but the native people believe that. So um, um, the great spirit is in everything. So that needs to reemerge. And so to, 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 re, to believe that this, is, this was actually the belief system of human beings for most of our history. This, the, it's not only recent perversion since the since the last three hundred years or five hundred years, say that that it's um, the industrial revolution. Um, so anyway, to answer the question, it just it just um, there's I, I just feel a strong. It makes me feel more passionate about um, somehow wanting to make a difference and, and wanting to honor these people and to bring it back into contemporary life as much as possible, and particularly honoring artists, which were you know, always are on the cutting edge of sensitivity and awareness of, of, uh, of, um, and, and how they're bridging the gap between the, the um, uh, white colonial culture and, and the native cultures and how they can translate, you know, through art, uh, a, a heightened awareness. And as an artist, I really appreciate that. So um, any of you, one thing I was, any of you aware of what happened in the Pacific? With the nuclear testing, it was not. It was horrible. Do you know? Do you know about the details of that? Anybody? Oh, know? Bikini Island. Or... Yeah, all that. Yeah. Oh well. The nuclear testing that went out there was just so totally massive. Well, I was just watching it. I mean, it, that that the the uh, treatment of native peoples just goes on. This was in the fifties. Um, Before you move to that, Joe, I just have a question for you about. I yeah. didn't quite get all, it seems like there's an objection by the Native Americans to the way that Edward Curtis photographed the Native Americans. Oh, right. What can you, I missed something in there. Could you, what do you know about it? Uh, you know? I think what you're saying is that um, he posed them. He put them in a certain uh, uh, <clears throat> physical environment to take their photo. So it was his arrangement. So. And okay, um, and so that, that in itself uh, leads to um, a certain disenfranchisement of them. You know, here's so, the yes. I think also he sold them, you know, that was for him, not for the Indians. Oh, really? I didn't know that. The yeah. money. Right, okay, yeah. So uh, that in itself, and so it, so it was a, a two-edged sword, he was, he was, showing their nobility and you did it with a lot of sensitivity but there was uh and so even i was like i'm t i've always been taken by by them and he can easily buy into that his there's a there's a perception there's a a background cultural um 
assumptions that Curtis is making there and an, and an imp imposition that Curtis made that is not easily detectable. And it would take a, a Native American sensitivity, artistic sensitivity to point that out. They're not, they're not invalidating Curtis as those, those artists, but we're saying there, there's another side to it. And um, by, so the current uh, photographers are allowing the people to maybe um, decide themselves how they wanna pose, how they wanna uh, dress, and uh, give them more space to be themselves and their, to explain their narrative. Um, and also to also update that these are, you know, these Curtis photos have such a strong impact on, on uh, our perception of Native Americans that it, this, this is the way they are now. And so these contemporary photographers are saying, this is, let's look at the way people are now, okay, these people are now. So, so it's, it's um, does that answer your question? In a way, I've always found his photos extraordinarily beautiful. Oh, yeah. I isolated them into like a photographic studio portrait. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, they are. They're That's powerful. what they all are. And I just, I got that from this, but, you know, from these comments. But the fact was that he was recording them. And if he hadn't done that work, there would be nothing from that time period where you're seeing Native Americans as they were before you see somebody with their, you know, whatever car behind them here and their, you know, new age partly clothing on and their heaviness because of the American diet. And, you know, it's so that's why I asked that question because I thought um, I can, I understand. I just thought I was missing something through the cracks. That's oh, why. I think these, uh, the comments that were maybe a little bit critical of Curtis, we're just adding a, a, a slightly tweak on, on a perspective that there's a lot of assumptions made about Native Americans from those photographs. And if you only form your opinion, you can get locked into it. That's all. They were just expanding awareness. I didn't take it as an invalidation. And any of them were invalidating Curtis's uh, uh, contribution. It, it just sort of a, a modern elaboration on that. That's all. Okay. I, I was was wondering. Um, is the art of photography at that time meant people had to stay still. So maybe they couldn't be standing in casual positions and hold it long enough. Um, yeah. You, you know, it's not like we have a, a camera now that we can click, click, click and get a million pictures. No, no that's true. That's, it was a very slow process. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, I don't know how long you had to sit, but you know, if you look back at like Victorian people and all, yeah. They must have smiled in their life, but you don't see that. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Because you had to hold it for such a long period and not move. <laughs> right. I don't think those pictures cloak their spirit. And I, I, I think, you know, God bless him that he took their pictures. They're beautiful, beautiful, yeah, so agree. beautiful. It's, it's not... It's not a matter of time or, or the costume of the time. It's like the, that spirit there. You could see that in those pictures. Yeah. 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 Not domitable, not domitable. I think the two photographers are saying they wanted to uh, you know, continue that tradition of Curtis, but, to, but, there, but also from the, he was not Native American. <laughs> so that in itself. So, they're, they're Native American photographers and they can unique, offer a unique photographic perspective. Maybe he was last live. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> I'm just saying, I think that's what I got from him. Yeah. That, that, uh, here, here again is a white man uh, uh, capturing the spirit of Native Americans. Okay, that's beautiful, that's wonderful, but it's still, it's a white man doing it. <laughs> and yeah. I think that's, yeah. uh, we want to take back our, our people or traditions in every way, including photography. Even though photography right. is kind of part of Native American tradition, but still that, that's that, that's what I got, you know. So it was you know, yeah. not invalidating for us. Okay. Uh, well I, I just I was just rereading, I don't want to show the thing that that those uh, nuclear tests, no, that was such a continuation of the gen genocide. But there was like uh, 66 main nuclear bombs that were dropped, uh, hydrogen bombs from in the 40s into the 50s, but 101 altogether. And and they and they told those the people were not protected. And, and there was a, there was a I don't know a couple hundred maybe a thousand or so on the Marshall Islands. 
and um, they um, <clears throat> they were removed from the main island bikini and moved down, but the, all the islands got radiated. And then they were told they could come back to some of the islands that it was safe after three years, knowing full well they were not safe. And they were guinea pigs. Mm -hmm. right. So the government has these uh, propaganda um, videos they put out uh, saying, and look how we're caring for these people. <laughs> yeah, after you do this to them. And but but and, and saying, well, actually they weren't that harmed, you know, but that's not true. I mean, the, the cancers that had uh, developed after that is it's ongoing. And the whole destruction of that ecostructure, which which is still true, you know. Um, and so it's just a the, the proper, uh, there's one uh, government propaganda film in the 50s. I couldn't believe it. They, they took a, uh, about five or six of these Marshall Islanders. They brought them to the States for tests who had, who had developed cancer or symptoms. And they were going mm -hmm. to the States for further testing in the state of the art equipment where they go into this closed chamber. I don't know. And, and, and the narrator of this government film calls these people savages. Um, the savages from Marshall Island are here on the mm -hmm. mainland for the first time. Mm -hmm. It's hard to believe that even in the 50s, they're calling them savages. They have, who are the savages? We dropped the bombs on them. You know, on their, mm -hmm. um, but there's a military base now. We're on those islands. One of main military. It's our nu It's a nuclear. Um, we, we, we have nukes there. It's one of our outposts there in protection against in the Pacific against China. And it's taken over. And this was their land. This was, and, and they were never impoverished. They always, before this happened in the 40s, they were living on this land. They had um, um, uh, their lifestyle, they were growing crops. And now they're all jammed into this, the, onto this one island where it's this horrible poverty. And, and they, they go every day to the island where the military, US military, and they, they water the lawns, you know, and they do domestic work. And, and the Americans, they interview some Americans. Oh, I love being here. I have my own private beach out of my condo. <laughs> yeah, whose beach do you yeah. have? And, the, and yeah. the people own the land, or, or they show videos, they show uh, footage of them, of the slum that developed uh, there. And it's like, that they used to be that way. But that's, um, so the point was, it's like this horrific uh, discounting of, of just using them as guinea pigs, they're not humans. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Thousand, hundred of them, or a thousand, and we can drop the bombs on, and, and mm -hmm. just me doing that. So, yeah, that's right. It's a, a disgrace that um, those those tests that went on and on and on. Uh, I got off the track there, but um, uh, what time do we have here? Three thirty-eight. Okay, uh, that's all the video I have. Do you want to see a little bit of that one I was talking about in the beginning? Uh, that one about the Incas? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, of course. No. Let's look at that. And then I'll maybe wait around until you watch the whole thing. Let's see where it is. Thank you. So, uh, all right, this is a two part series. Let me just watch a few minutes of it before you start it. But this is the one where they he figured out that, that in the in the Inca Bores described themselves as being troubled with a strange disease. The Inca myths are the uh, astronomy uh, and it's hidden in their mess. A disease of the heart, they said, for which gold was the specific remedy. Today the gold is gone and so is the empire of the Incas. The Spanish came for treasure and found it. But what if there was a treasure more precious to the Incas than gold? treasure that the Spanish never found. When the Spanish arrived, 
The Inca Empire could field more than 100,000 men at arms. There were only 170 Spaniards. Yet the lightly armed conquistadores slaughtered 7,000 Incas in their first day of battle. 40 Incas for every Spaniard. One of the things he says that is such a uh, a mystery. Even even though they had they had some basic guns and, and horses and steel, they were so outnumbered. What he's saying is this astronomical prediction uh, was in the background, and they all, it's almost like they let it happen. They were that they um, um, could have taken the Spanish out way earlier on their way up, and they didn't. And so there was there was say it's like the myth. That this um, pr prophecy that was there was in the background, and and so it paralyzed them in a way to really uh, uh, stopping them. They kind of overwhelmed them easily. They just surrounded the horses with a thousand people and taking these conquistador down, but they didn't do that. Within fifty years, out of a population of seven million, five million were dead. How could an empire of the size and sophistication of that of Rome be defeated so easily? The orthodox account, the Spanish account, is that it just was. Four thousand miles away and four hundred years later, Historian Bill Sullivan read this account when still a student and felt then it wasn't enough. For over 20 years, Sullivan has traveled back and forth from his home in Massachusetts to the mountains of Peru in search of a deeper truth. He was convinced that behind the military clash, there had to be a more profound story, a clash of cultures, a collision between two incompatible ways of seeing and understanding the world. You know the Indi first Indiana Jones movie where Indy's looking for Marion in the Kasbah and uh, this Sufi warrior comes out and does this amazing riff with his sword and Indy just goes and shoots him. That, that's the conquest. It's two totally different worlds, two totally different sets of objectives and one of them had to lose out. According to Bill Sullivan, more than the military might of the two sides, it was the psychological state of the Incas that was the key to what really happened. It's been his lifelong conviction that if he could get inside and understand the Inca mind, he would find a deeper history of the last days of the Incas. The key to Bill Sullivan's quest was a simple question. When the Incas found the barbarians were at the gate, when they realized the end was nigh, what would they want to save? What would you want to survive you into the future? What would be your most precious treasure? The Spanish, the answer was simple, gold. And not as works of Inca art and beauty, only as bullion. Everything they looted, they melted down. Only a few trinkets escaped the Spanish furnaces. Bill believes for the Incas there was a treasure far more precious than gold and thinks he knows where it's hidden. He has spent 20 years studying the Spanish chronicles of the conquest and believes they contain a forgotten record, a glimpse inside a lost world, not in the parts every other historian has studied, the factual account of what the Spanish did and found, but encoded in Inca folk tales, also recorded in those chronicles, and utterly overlooked for four centuries. Bill Sullivan, alone among the experts, believes that when properly decoded, the myths tell a history of the Inca Empire so secret that it was known only to the Inca high priests. He believes the Incas who told these stories to the Spanish 
were doing so because they wanted someone in the future to decode them and know we are not savages. This is who we were. This is what we achieved. This is what we believed. This is our epitaph. I think it's a shame that in our time we've sort of grown accustomed to thinking that the messages that come to us from the past through myth are somehow inherently meaningless, that they are sort of the uh, poetic imaginings of savage people. Because it really misses the point, because there have been moments when I knew to a certainty that I was listening to a message that had been encrypted 1,300 years ago, 2,000 years ago, and meant to be understood. We owe the Incas a tremendous debt because they have allowed us a very, very kind of a clear window back into the past. History records the tragedy of the Incas. A once proud people were utterly defeated and humiliated. Their culture swept aside. Yet if Bill is right, we are forced to ask what kind of people, in the face of defeat, could have had the presence of mind to leave to the future a message in a bottle containing what was, in effect, their declaration of the human spirit. Sullivan's research began where everyone has to begin, with what the Spanish saw and chronicled as they traveled up into the mountains. The country is populous. There are mines in many parts of it. They have stores of fuel and maize and of all the other necessaries. We know the empire they found was only 90 years old, but it was the last and greatest expression of cultural ideas nearly 2,000 years old. So that message in a bottle could be the key to 2,000 years of Andean history. The chronicles were written by priests, by soldiers, and by administrators administrators of the Spanish crown. And naturally, they had different perspectives. The administrators were interested in where resources were and in descriptions of the extent of the empire. But there's a human element that comes out in any one of these chronicles of a curiosity and, and an amazement at the sophistication and scale upon which this empire operated. What they discovered was a culture that in this hard environment of isolated valleys had found a way to unite disparate peoples. The Inca Empire at its height contained at least a hundred quite distinct groups trading together at peace. It stretched from Colombia to Chile and fed seven million people. The ideals of cooperation that underlay the empire were its real genius. Ideals that had kept the Andes at peace for 800 years. Something the restless tribes of Europe have never managed. And we might never have known how all this was achieved, except for the Spanish. In the chronicles, along with their inventory of the empire, 
The Spanish also wrote down what Bill thinks is the key to understanding the cooperative culture of the Andes, their myths. One of the remarkable services that the Spanish have provided to posterity is that uh, they took down these myths in relatively pure form. They didn't try to understand them and they didn't try to sort of Christianize them or put a, a Western religious spin on them because they wanted them to be strange and because they wanted them to appear apart. In a number of cases, you'll find a chronicler who will set down in, in pristine form an Andean myth and then conclude by saying something like, had these people not been so dull and blind and had they possessed writing, perhaps they would not have been so stupid. At the start of his project, Bill had spent six months living with the Indians, learning their language and beliefs. He did not presume that the Inca myths were meaningless superstition. He'd studied the highly controversial hypothesis that a knowledge of astronomy had spread around the world before recorded history began, and that the great civilizations from China and India to Egypt all used the exact same code to preserve knowledge of the stars in myth. And these ancient cultures were obsessed by the stars because they saw a sky we never do, whereas we see only a scattering of the brightest stars. They, without polluted skies, saw the full glory of the Milky Way. If Bill could prove that myths were encoded astronomy, it would rewrite ancient history. He believed that Inca astronomy was descended from that ancient tradition and so could be the test case. Incas were the last living branch of an ancient tree, which may already have been old when the pyramids were built. I was interested in the myths. I was looking for myths because I was working on the hypothesis that there was astronomy encrypted in them. However unconventional the idea, Bill thought he could test it. Like the Spanish priests before him, Bill went to the villages and collected the stories from those who still had knowledge of myths and stars. And the first myth he came across was the creation myth. Long, long ago, at Lake Titicaca, a tall, bearded stranger appeared with a staff in his hand. And he went to the island of Titicaca in the middle of the lake, and there he commanded the sun, the moon, and the stars to rise. And they rose. And at the same time, he took clay and made models, each of a man and a woman, and created the tribal ancestors of every tribe in the Andes. And to each pair, he gave the language that they would speak the songs that they would sing, the seeds that they would plant, and the dances that they would dance. I went then and here, so um, <clears throat> it goes on through two parts. And he, um, he went to the boss to the, in the 90s to the um, planetarium in Boston, armed with his research, and he had the planetarium adjust the skies back to as they were in South America in the Andes at 650 AD. And to confirm, and he didn't know, um, he had this idea of what they would look like, what was rising and all, and it confirmed it. But, so he could look at the sky the way he could set up that the way they were looking at it in 650 AD and what shocked them, what 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 the, you know, what oh my God, this the, the Milky Way had the sun was no longer on the on the uh, <clears throat> uh, summer equinox. Uh, no longer rising with the, the Milky Way had disappeared and this was going to be. So um, he goes on like that. So it's pretty fascinating. Anyway, I just want to wait wrap tight in case you want to continue with that. Yeah. All right. So good. So uh, uh, that was fun. That was it was. Doing the, it was uh, more than fun. Yeah, it was great. And it was learning. So like next time, two weeks or so, um, Shift out to the other side of the world and uh, China and uh, the Song Dynasty and probably mm -hmm. the Dynasty after that. Yeah, that should be good. All right. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you, you Joe. Very much.
Thank you. Take care. Take care. It was care enjoyable. All. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, great. I'm going to remember to stop recording. I'm going to start recording.